Nope. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Heidi Bretz. I run business development for the OpenStack Foundation. And thank you for coming and joining Adrian and I by the fire, Adrian and me, um, for our fireside chat. So um, if you're in this room, you probably have heard about Mirantis. You probably know what they do. And if you know Mirantis, you probably know that they just raised a record-breaking $100 million B round of financing. And it's record-breaking because it's the largest ever in open source history, and it's one of the largest in technology history for a Series B across all of technology. Um, so, you know, definitely rock stars. And if, oh, if uh, Mirantis are the rock stars right now of OpenStack, I am joined today by Adrian Ionel, who is the Mick Jagger <laughs> of OpenStack. So, Mick, Adrian... Have a seat. Hey, thanks, Heidi. If it gets it's, too hot. That's quite a setup there. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm with Rockstar here. Um, so why don't we start by just having you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about kind of your journey in the beginning of Mirantis and, and how you guys got started um, and how that kind of evolved over time. Yeah, sure. So I joined Mirantis five years ago. I'm an engineer by education. I spent most of my early years uh, building software and later uh, parallel processing systems in various places around the world. When I joined the company, we had a phenomenal, phenomenal team of engineers, but it wasn't quite clear where we would have an opportunity to build a really large and exciting business. But fairly early on, we figured out that OpenStack is something that it's extremely promising that can really change the world. So we decided all together as a team to make a bit, big bet in OpenStack back in 2010. Got it. And you started as a services company, right? So uh, money, could you tell us a little bit how, about how you changed kind of your direction at Mirantis and how that may have affected your financing or how maybe the reverse was true? Maybe um, your financing and the opportunity to finance yourself affected your direction. Right. So... Many, many people think that Miranti started uh, in the OpenStack business as a services company, but we actually used that only as a strategy. From the very beginning, when we started out on our OpenStack journey in 2010, we felt that companies will ultimately buy software and a complete solution for OpenStack. But we looked at other companies that had entered open source spaces early on, and we figured out that the way to monetize early on and the, the way to gain customer traction and to really understand what the customer's pain points are is by offering services around the upstream code base. So we decided to start with that to win very large customers, build a successful business, build a successful team, and then at the appropriate time, introduce our software offering, which we did more than a year ago. However, we built the R&D team at Mirantis more than two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. So you really listened to what your customers wanted and then developed your product around that rather than doing the reverse, developing a product and then changing it. It's actually a combination of two things. We, I mean, we don't believe on just uh, following what our customers say one by one. We listen extremely carefully to our customers, and we want to live in our customers' heads. Uh, at the same time, we have our own vision, right? We have our own belief as to where OpenStack should go, how it can create value, what the biggest pain points are. And then we want to marry the two into a vision and into a roadmap that we believe in. Uh, we believe in. So yeah. that's been really our plan all along. And then when it came time to raise capital, I mean, there's a lot of activity out there around OpenStack and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of young companies. How did you differentiate yourself from the others? Or how did, what made you stand out? What made you special um, in that you were able to attract the attention of a lot of investors? Right. So we raised the first round of capital, $20 million, uh, quite a lot while ago, maybe 18 months ago. Uh, we attracted some very high-quality investors at the time who helped us build the company through the first phase. What I think made us compelling for the Series B is, first and foremost, our team. We have a phenomenal team, very good colleagues on, on my management team, extremely deep engineering talent, very good sales force. So the, the entire Mirantis team is strong and cohesive and certainly the biggest asset that we have. 
The other huge differentiator that made us stand out is the customer traction. We have very real revenues. We have an enormous amount of growth that we've delivered consistently uh, throughout the past four or five years since we started the OpenStack journey. And then finally, um, the clincher was a very, very compelling product story with a great vision behind it. So you marry all these three things together, and this is typically what investors are looking for. Do you have a high quality team? Do you have strong traction so it's not all just paperware? And then do you have also compelling vision beyond that how to turn this into a really exciting and, and large company? And we were able to pull all of those three things together, which I believe what led to a successful outcome. So let's go back um, kind of before the Series B to your first round of funding, which was much smaller. You took uh, all corporate investment um, at that point, right? There was no... Uh, it's not exactly accurate. Uh, we have some corporate investors uh, like Red Hat and Dell, but we also have some VCs that are really not uh, strictly traditional corporate investors. So Intel Capital invests very much like a professional VC. Uh, Sapphire Ventures that was just up here on the panel is definitely a professional VC. Uh, West Summit Cup Capital, who's also earlier here on the pa panel, uh, professional VC. So we had a mix between corporate investors and and professional venture capitalists in the first round. How did you choose that mix? And was that, if you were to do it over again, would you, do, would you make the same decision? I believe so. I think for every single investor that we brought on at the time, we had an extremely compelling reason at the time. Intel was our lead investor early on. We took them on because they have a deep pedigree in open source in a data center. <laughs> They've done a spectacular job helping build some terrific companies in that space, including Red Hat early on and quite a few others. West ha Summit Capital, we took on because of the China story. You've heard <laughs> David before. China, open source, open stack, huge market opportunity. We want to play there. We just opened an office in Beijing a few months ago. We have quite a few great customers in China, so that was important to us. Ericsson, we took on as an invest investor because we absolutely felt that all the service providers in the world eventually are going to move to a scale-out cloud infrastructure. And we believe that the only choice that makes sense for them is OpenStack, and we want to play there. We want to be the dominant uh, vendor to the service provider space. This is why we took Ericsson on. Red Hat, we took on also early on as an investor because we felt there are quite a few things that we can learn from them. They are a very successful open source company. They pioneered a very successful business model in this space. And we also felt at a time that maybe we can find some alignment between our technology and our business model and theirs. So for every single investor, we had a very good reason why we took them on. Would you recommend this to the startups in the room? Are there any startups in the room? Anyone starting a company? Okay. Is that a path you'd recommend? I would. I, I, the first recommendation I would have is to look f at the people, right? So it's not just the name or the VC that you bring on, but who are actually the people that you are going to work with because you're going to work with them for a very long period of time, and it's almost impossible to get a divorce between you know, the company and your private equity or VC investor. So you're gonna be there together for a long time. So look at the person first and foremost and see if there is a good cultural match. And then also look at who the company is, who the investor is, and see if there is a good fit. Okay, so you say you're married to your investor, mm -hmm. and so I look at Red Hat as an investor in Morantis, and uh, you very quickly turned around and went into head-to-head -head competition with them. So how is that marriage doing? How did you manage that? <laughs> 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 Are well, you guys in counseling? Um, <laughs> that was a more turbulent <laughs> relationship, I would say. Um, first of all, I want to say that we have tremendous respect for Red Hat. Uh, there is an enormous amount that we can learn from them. We strive from l to learn from them all the time. Um, we went into the relationship full of enthusiasm, and we very much hope that we can find a business model that works for Red Hat and works for us. As it turned out, uh, that was not possible to make that happen. So we decided to go in our independent way and really stick to our guns and pursue our vision, even if that leads to, to direct competition with, with them. 
And in the end, probably when they make a lot of money, um, <laughs> the marriage will be fixed again, <laughs> mm-hmm. or at least it'll be over. But someone will get a big settlement. <laughs> well, well, I will tell you. I will tell you this: is that Red Hat did c- contact us a while ago, and they did indicate that they're at least a happy shareholder in Mirandi. So, yes. so far, so good. Great, great. Um, so, I, I have a question. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I started with the OpenStack Foundation almost two years ago, and you know, it's the first I'd ever heard of Mirantis, and probably nobody else had either. And now I look at Forbes, I look at the Wall Street Journal, I look at major publications, and you know, when, when OpenStack is mentioned, I see HP, I see IBM, I see these giant companies that have been for a, around for a long time. Amarantis, <laughs> you're just kind of sticking out there, you know, as kind of well. How did they get in there? How did you go from from nobody's heard of you to Forbes in three years? Yeah, well, building a brand is a hugely important part of a strategy for success for a young company. And here, are my here's my view on how to build a brand. So first and foremost, you have to build a brand around the substance that's true and and real, right? And the most important part of that substance for us at, at Mirantis is what we do for our customers. We're very fanatical about helping our customers succeed. We have very deep engineering talent, and we have extremely good technology. So there is a lot of substance in what we do. And so we built a brand first and foremost, around the value that we create for our customers. And we aimed to win very big customers and make them successful and make them huge fans of Mirantis. The second part, in my view, of building a brand if having, is having some kind of a unique angle that resonates with your target audience. And our unique angle in this particular play is this very fundamental idea of being a pure play OpenStack company and taking a radically different approach than most of the other vendors in this community. And the difference there is that we do not seek to lock customers in, but we are completely open, hence pure play open stack. And that resonates extremely well with the fundamental mission of open stack itself. And finally, you know, the third ingredient of building a brand is to be reasonably outspoken, to stand for what you believe in, and not to be a, a boring company. So we have strived to do all of those three things together. Start with the value that we create for our customers with a foundation have a very unique angle and a vision that we can build fans around and then be reasonably outspoken. And I think this is kind of what built the brand for us. Thanks. Uh, So I'm sure as a startup, like every startup, you learn from your mistakes. You make mistakes, you learn, you move on. Could you possibly spare any of the entrepreneurs in this audience um, the mistakes that they might make by sharing with us some of the mistakes Mirantis made or some of the things you might do differently uh, the second time around. So maybe they can kind of leapfrog and avoid those. Yeah. Well, there's almost an endless, I would say, room for opportunities to, to make mistakes when you build a company and where is there when there is so much at stake. I would say... I'm trying to, to figure out what are the biggest ones that we made or we we always or the we almost made. So I think one of the most important things as a company is to stay focused and to be very, very clear as to what you go after and what you don't go after as a company. And it's always incredibly tempting to always say yes to the next customer mm-hmm. and you know, slightly diverge uh, from your core path you know, chasing revenue. And I think that we've made some of those mistakes occasionally in the past, and we, fortunately, we reasonably quickly corrected them. So one piece of recommendation that I have is just to be very, very disciplined in 
terms of what your core value is, your core value, your core proposition to your customers, and stick to that quite religiously. Because if you're going to lose your focus, I think your company uh, is not going to succeed. The second area where it's very easy to make mistakes is in in hiring, and especially hiring people in your key management team. Um, and I encourage anybody, uh, everybody here to spend as much time as possible with your prospective key hires and make sure that there is a very, very strong cultural fit between the people you bring on board and the people that are already in the company. And we made uh, here and there the occasional m mistake. I, I think these are probably the two most important things to, to avoid if you can. Mm -hmm. So... Mark mentioned in the earlier panel, um, and they talked about some of the recent acquisitions uh, among OpenStack companies, big acquisitions um, for such an early uh, young technology. So you certainly have probably had the opportunity to sell Mirantis several times over to some of the same companies that have bought, you know, the MetaClouds and the, and the uh, ink tanks. And, but you're not. You decided to go for this big round of, uh, of venture capital. So why did you make that decision? I, I think it's going to be better for us. I think it will be more fun, more exciting. And I think there is a tremendous room to, for a young company in the OpenStack ecosystem. I think it's going to be difficult for OpenStack to succeed without companies like us. If the community is going to be putting all its faith for an ultimately su successful outcome for OpenStack in the hands of established companies, I think that's very risky because they do not necessarily move fast enough. They have many, many other business priorities besides OpenStack. And therefore, I think we provide, we, we we play an incredibly important role in the OpenStack ecosystem, probably as the one of the very few, if not the only company of scale who can actually compete legitimately for the business of somebody like Wells Fargo, or Ericsson, or AT&T, or Orange, and win versus very large established players. Do you, um, just in knowing kind of the ecosystem and the folks involved here at, uh, in OpenStack, do you see companies out there or a space where you think someone has an opportunity to be the next $100 million Series B fundraiser? I think one of the most exciting areas within OpenStack is networking. And that's one of the areas with big unsolved problems. So I would be looking for, for that space. If somebody comes up with compelling solutions that are completely open source and fits, fit well into what OpenStack is trying to accomplish, I think that's, that's an exciting area to look for. So, so now you're Mirantis, and you're in this crowd with you know, HP and IBM and, and Cisco and others, and you say you can compete for, for large customers. Um, it's getting, I mean, they're getting pretty good at what they do, too, and they're, you're all kind of converging and doing the same things. How are you, what are you thinking about going forward and how you're going to compete with some of these big guys? I mean, you've got your money, you've got somewhat of a brand, What's your strategy for kind of the next year or two to compete with these giant companies? Right. So we can't reveal everything that we have coming down the pipe in terms of what our playbook is going to be, but there are a few data points that I'm happy to share with you. So first and foremost, we believe we will continuously outpace our competitors. We are faster moving than HP and most of these large guys. You'll see us come, come up with new features, new capabilities faster than, than other people. We also have a much more integrated story than virtually all of our competitors. We have the software, Mirai's OpenStack, we have professional services, we have training, we provide a complete solution 
um, in ways that most of our competitors, at least at this point, can't. And finally, the third leg is of our stool is we're very open as a company. We have a lot of partners around us, and many of these partners uh, will find it difficult to partner successfully with those vendors that pursue a complete integrated stack strategy. So to just give an example, uh, if somebody wants to sell a top to bottom solution that includes hardware and networking storage and the like, they are not going to be very likely to partner with somebody that has all these other elements as part of the, the solution they are selling. Right? So it comes back to the fundamental value proposition to be pure play open stack. So we aim to have as many partners as possible build a successful business around Mirantis rather than trying to capture the entire revenue opportunity from a customer by ourselves. So that's a big part of our playbook. And probably one of the reasons, well, among many, but one of the reasons that you were able to attract capital and really I impressive investors is because you had a, a nice kind of portfolio of marquee customers. So in the early days, just for the benefit of the startups, when you were Mirantis and nobody knew who you were, how did you get those you know, first big customers? We got them because, the, uh, coming back to the kind of the fundamentals, is because the core of who we are is very high quality, very deep engineering talent. We know what we're talking about when we get in front of our customers and they appreciate that. So we went for customers who appreciated that, who are more leading edge, who are looking less for marquee brand, but they're looking very much for the substance of what it is that we can do. So it's not by accident that some of our early wins were companies with a very deep level of engineering expertise themselves. People like, for example, PayPal or WebEx or even NASA was a very early on Mirantis OpenStack customer. So they looked beyond the brand, they looked at the people, they looked at what we had to offer and decided based on that. Right? And once we built this first initial pool of 10 to 20 very high quality customers that helped us with you know, winning the other 120 customers. Okay, so you have an IPO in your future, or it's it's rumored. And that's the goal, yeah. Okay, um, and I would assume your hundred million was raised on a valuation of I don't know, eight hundred a million. Are you allowed to talk about that? <laughs> I am, but I don't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just guessing. I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm no, we're not disclosing our valuation. Okay, um, so if you uh, if you were to guess, when do you think that might that event might happen. Just We're aiming for 2016. Okay. Okay, so you're gearing up for that. So to the startups in the audience, um, this could be your future. This is possible. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to have this talk with Adrian. And I've asked him the questions I wanted answered, but I'm sure that in the, the audience there are questions that you would like to ask him that are really particular to your business or to your fundraising efforts. So does anyone have... Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hey, Adrian. I'm, I'm Ryan from Storm. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm actually not, a, I don't have a startup. Uh, I'm a venture investor. But uh, since I passed on Morantis in the A round and the B round, <laughs> uh, I admit it fully. Uh, I, I think one of the pieces of advice you can give to the entrepreneurs maybe is just talk a little bit about getting turned down and, and getting those and kind of how to help think about that. Because now you probably had you know, way more money than. You, you, you wanted to raise for this last round, but in the early days it was tough, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I don't know that it was particularly tough in the early days, and I, I, I recall the conversation we had with Storm, Storm Ventures. It was really like a, a 30 minutes, one hour introductory meeting, and to me, that's kind of like a mutual evaluation. We're trying to figure out very, very quickly, is there a very good fit between how you guys see the world and who you are and between how we see the world and who we are? And if there isn't a very good chemistry, then we move on. So I don't see it as a re rejection. I see it much more like, is there a good match between who the investor is and who we are and then go from there? And I think it's very, very important to have a, an incredibly thick skin when you go through the fundraising process. We met a 
pretty high number of investors over the past um, six months right, to get this round done. And the feedback ranged from, you know, this is a huge range. I mean, there were some investors who said, well, boring story, open source never succeeds, you know, Red Hat is the only co company that's ever made it, to investors that were just keep bidding up the price. So there's a w w wide diversity of opinions out there in the investment community as to what constitutes a great investment. So don't don't let the rejection or lack of a match discourage you in any way. And how much was being involved, kind of based on open source, a challenge for you? Because, I mean, there have definitely been a couple of very vocal VCs um, in the Valley about uh, expressing their opinions about really open source companies not being a good investment. Was that something that you had to deal with often that you heard often from, I know Andreessen Horowitz is not a believer. Um, yeah. A couple of other VCs that are kind of, they're vocal about it and blogging about it. Yeah, so the, it was a factor. I don't know that it was a decisive factor. I also don't, I also believe that venture capitalists do have a bit of a herd instinct sometimes. So they tend to be trendy and go with, with fashion, uh, fashion of the moment. But if you're looking at the very, very best investments in history, I think the vast majority of them were extremely controversial at the time, where people said, oh, no, I don't think this is going to work. So I think I would, I would even say that if everybody lines up and says this is an awesome investment, that's probably a huge red flag. I think you want to be much more on the edge where very few people believe that this is a sane investment and then you're kind of the crazy outlier. I think that's much, much better place to be. Interesting. Anybody else? Sorry, Ryan, you weren't a good fit. <laughs> you weren't a match. Hi, Clark. Thanks very much for uh, some of the insight. And I've, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I've raised some capital for, for startups previously and the speed dating process, it's like a sales funnel, but with a much wider entrance and a much smaller exit. One of the I interesting things that you said, and I, uh, there's a lot of conflicts between your investors and what you do, which is interesting. And it's interesting to hear those stories, but what's even more interesting to me is, is what value did you get back from some of those investors? Because they always, it, it, mer investors are like a marriage and it takes a long time to cultivate that marriage. And then they always say, oh, we have this great network that we're gonna create all these wonderful introductions and you're gonna be hugely, fabulously successful with us. But then when the check hits the bank, it's usually like, hey, email, dot, 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 you guys should meet. And then that's pretty much it until you do a down round and then they're all over you. Right, so if you could comment a little bit on some of the more successful relationships that have come from some of those investors and why you think that was. Yeah, we actually got it, uh, now that I, sit, uh, that I think about it, we got a tremendous amount of value from all of our investors, including Red Hat. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So to just give you some very concrete examples. Intel Capital, our lead investor for Series A, Darmesh Tucker, who I believe is unfortunately not in Paris today because he has to be at the Intel Capital Global Summit in California this week, uh, definitely has done an incredible amount of work for us in terms of introductions to customers, in terms of Intel becoming our own customer, hugely, hugely valuable. So they are direct, you know, kind of dollar signs, revenue and opportunities attached to all the work that he has done for us. Uh, to give an example, even the relationship with IBM that we have in place today was initiated at a very senior executive level through Intel executives, all right? Very valuable. Uh, let me give another example. Ericsson, who also invested in Series A and now also in Series B, signed a $30 million software agreement with us in the first quarter of 2014. Um, hugely valuable investors uh, to us, and in fact, our revenue with them has grown 50% larger even since beyond what we had planned for this year. So that's definitely a very valuable investor. Dell has been a Mirantis customer now for 
three years, we've probably done 15 to 20 other customers together where Dell and us have gone to market together in opportunities, so that's hugely valuable. Uh, Red Hat was a Mirantis customer last year where for, for our OpenStack training for part of our technology and software. So they created revenue for us. We're grateful for it. Um, what else can I pick? Um, West Summit, you just heard the China story. They help us hire the uh, general manager for China that we brought on board two months ago. We've helped win some Chinese customers following direct introductions from them. Uh, what else? Uh, I mean, this, this, these are just a few examples. So in my view, it's also very much what do you do as an entrepreneur to use the relationship. Are you going to be completely passive and expect that everything is being handed to you, or are you going to make the most out of every single introduction that you receive? And in my experience, the people are going to make introductions. They are going to support you, and then they're going to watch what you do. How hard do you work in order to make something out of that initial contact? So I'd say, all of our investors, including those that may be controversial today, have actually made a substantial difference to get us to where we are today. Actually, that makes a real case for corporate venturing and, and taking money from companies, because each one of those cases where you actually benefited, the money came from a technology partner, customer, something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Anybody else have a question? I knew it. We have time. Hello. Mika is my name from eSoftis. Um, thanks for sharing your perspective. You had mentioned that one of the mistakes that startups need to avoid is hiring. And um, I would like if you could comment more on what you could call some of the steps um, we need to focus new startups in making sure that they hire the right caliber of staffs they need. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot written about this um, by people that are a lot uh, smarter at this than, than I am, but I... I will say this, I think, Get to know the people that you're going to hire in senior roles as well as you possibly can. Make sure that you don't have just a very good fit in terms of skill, but in very good personal chemistry with the rest of your team and yourself. Try to understand as much as possible as to what motivates those folks and how that is aligned with the company's purpose, right? Got it. Anybody else? Okay, I think we are out of time anyway, and I have asked all my questions. Any last words for these guys? Well, I want to thank the OpenStack community for creating this opportunity for us. We wouldn't be here without having this gigantic community around us to help us build this business. And of course, the OpenStack Foundation that's made it all possible in the first place. We're thrilled to be here. Thank you. Well, good luck to you going forward. Um, we expect to hear more great things from Marantis, and who knows what we'll be on stage talking about next year with Adrian. So. Yeah, tune in. Stay tuned. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks.